Welcome to lecture 4J, Directory Based Cache Coherence. We have seen about how coherence protocol is how significant and important is as far as the working of a multi-processor system is concerned. And we already learned about one category of cache coherence protocols known as Snoop based cache coherence protocol and today we are going to see another category of cache coherence protocol broadly titled as directory based cache coherence. So, if you take a typical symmetric multi core processor, what we have seen in the last video is you have multiple processors that you see, they have their own private caches and they are going to access main memory or communicate among them through a common bus. But if you look into that, when you have more advanced versions of microprocessors, when you have multiple processors like this in a multi core environment, then the underlying communication medium need not be always bus based. It can be some other mechanism. So, the essentiality is that this common interconnection network may have a property such that at any given point in time, all of them may not be able to snoop. It can be a hierarchical ring or any kind of another topology where it is not a single common point to which all these multi core processors are going to snoop at. So, when such a snooping facility is not available, whatever conventional snoop based cache coherence that we have learned will not work because the underlying principle of the snoop based cache coherence mechanism is there should be a single common bus upon which everyone, every cache controller can snoop on. Let us try to understand what are the limitations of a snooping based cache coherence protocol. So, the first one to start with always scaling is a problem. If you look at this bus based model that is been shown here, we have multiple caches, they all are connected into a single shared bus that you have. So, the scaling issue is a big problem. So, here in this case, we have 4 processors. What if I am going to talk about 50 processors, 50 of them connecting to a single shared bus is not a feasible architecture. Sometimes the interconnect has to be a single arbitration point that is what is been mentioned for snooping to work it has to be a single arbitration point. What if we use a kind of a um, setup like that if this is not a bus. So, the po popular topology that we use in multi core setup is the network concept which we will learn in the subsequent videos of the course. Now, one of the important requirement wherein in bus based model it will work is all messages has to be broadcast. So, even for a small update or whatever that is happening, this broadcasting involves significant traffic and cost overhead. So, these are some of the limitations of a snoop based cache coherence protocol. So, now we are going to introduce about directory based protocol. So, what is this directory based protocol? We have a dedicated structure which is known as a directory. So, here we are not using the concept of snooping, we are introducing a concept known as directory. So, what is this directory? The directory is basically a small control logic that coordinates the actions required for the coherence protocol and how it functions? It sends and receives messages to and from the caches which are associated with the processors and the corresponding main memory and it is much scalable even if the number of processors increases the directory based protocol will still work. So, here we are going to introduce about three terminologies in terms of node, local node, home node and remote node. So, local node is a node where a request basically originates, home node is a node where the memory location of the address is being residing. So, I am going to talk about let us say three nodes A, B and C. So, A is going to generate a new request that A wants something. So, A is known as the local node from where the request originates. Now, what is home node? It is a node where the memory location of the address that is residing. So, I am going to talk about C. So, it is a place, it is there in C that it locates, but remote node is a node that has a copy of the cache. What if this particular address to location is now currently kept in dirty state in let us say location B. So, A is requesting for something which is in C, but the latest copy of that is available in B. So, the local node is requesting for a data to home node, 
but home node finds that it is the latest copy is not available in the home node it is available in another node known as remote node so there should be a mechanism by which the remote node should be able to send the updated copy to the local node to satisfy its request so the directory based protocol typically work on a setup where we have a communication mechanism which may not support snooping so you have multiple caches are there and all these caches will send their appropriate request and then we have the underlying main memory that is the lower level memory that you have and then you have a central point wherein the directory is being kept so this is a central point at which the directory and this caches will send the information so everything required in order to make a cache coherent system is available inside this directory so what we have seen here is in a directory based cache coherence protocol there exists a central entity known as a directory and all these cache controllers whenever they operate on this shared data they send specific messages to this directory the directory will have its own bookkeeping mechanism it will look into and try to understand where are the copies currently available are, is it simply shared across multiple processors if so who are the shared processors and then accordingly it will take a decision to which all cache controller i have to send messages so messages are now not broadcasted messages are now sent into appropriate nodes in order to ensure that a coherent system exists here so it's totally a different approach that we have seen from the conventional snoop based architecture now let us talk about a simple directory based protocol so what we do is for each cache block in memory we are going to have p plus 1 number of bits that is associated so every cache block will have p plus 1 number of bits where p is the number of processors so consider the case that i'm talking about an eight core system and then you have lot of cache blocks are there so for each cache block i am going to attach nine bits so what is this nine bits one bit each so one bit each for the processor indicating whether the block is in p's cache or not and there is another one bit which is known as an exclusive bit which indicate that the cache has the only copy of the block and can update it without notifying others so let us try to understand we have in this case eight processors we call it as p1 up to p8 now i have a cache block let's say i call it as block a another cache block is block b now each one of them will have eight bits which will correspond to this so p1 p2 etc like that this is p8 and the last one is known as an exclusive bit so whenever you know that this cache block a is currently kept in p1 so this p1's value is 1 and all others would be zero and if it is kept in a read only mode then this also is zero suppose if p1 is keeping this particular cache block for a write operation then what happens is rather this is not zero then that is going to be one in this case so this is going to be one so the last bit of e if that value is one then there exists only one bit out of the remaining eight bit which is going to be one that means that particular so each one of them is specifically assigned to a processor so if there are four processors currently holding the data then corresponding to those processor the bit should be set to one since they are all are keeping that means they are in the shared mode we have already seen that similarly for cache block b also some one combination would be there and some combination should be zero wherever you have one means a copy of b is currently available in these processors now for example consider the case of a c everything is zero except one and you your e bit is also one this means this particular cache block is kept by this processor for example it may be p5 it is currently kept by p5 in the exclusive mode so p5 is kept keeping the block c for a write operation so in this way this is a simple mechanism wherein for every cache block in the main memory we will have p plus 1 number of bits in the directory so now let us see what happens on a read or a write now on a read the set of process we have to set the processor bit and arrange the supply of data so when a new read request come out of this p bits we have to identify which particular processor is requesting for the data the bit associated with that processor has to be set to 1 and then we have to supply the data from the others who already have the bit is equal to 1 
So what do you do on a right? On the right, we need to invalidate all those who are sharers. We have to invalidate them, and then I have to reset their bits, and then I have to supply the data, and then the EBIT has also has to be set to one. So this EBIT exclusive bit indicates that a cache has the only copy of the block, and that particular processor which is currently holding can update it without notifying others. So this is basically a simple directory based protocol that we see. Now let us consider an example. Consider four processors P1, P2, P3, and P4 as given here, and we are going to talk about a particular cache block wherein all these processors are going to access. So this is the directory structure associated uh, with this. So now we can see what this mechanism is all about. So P1, P2, P3, and P4. These are the four processors. There is one bit each of for each of these processors. So initially, all these bits are zero, and the E bit is also zero. So that means this block is not cached by any processor. The latest value is available inside main memory. Now, what is our first operation? P1 has a read miss. P1 wanted to read since it is not there. It is going to fetch from main memory. So ultimately, what happens? This bit now, P1's bit is going to be set to one. So this is a central directory. In the central directory, the bit associated with the P1 is made to one. This means that if someone look at the directory, the meaning is this particular block. So similarly, for every block, we have a directory structure like this. This particular block is currently kept by P1, but the value in main memory and the value that is kept by P1 are same because the exclusive bit is. Not that is being said. Now let us go to the another one. P3 has a read miss, and P3 also is going to fetch from main memory. So now in this case, what happens? Both P1 and P3 have a copy of this block. Since the exclusive block is bit is not set, P1 and P3 values are same as that of main memory. Now think of a case. We have a write miss. So P2 wanted to perform a write. This is the challenging one. When you wanted to perform a write. Then we have to ensure that nobody else should be sharing the data or having the copy of the data at that point of time. So we can look at that at this point when someone wanted to perform a write. Already P1 and P3 are keeping a copy. So this looking at the directory structure, we will come to know that P1 and P3 are the sharers at this point. So we have to invalidate P1 and P3 and make E bit set for P2, and then you fetch the block from the main memory. So you have now P2 is having that. And P2 is having it in an exclusive state. So previously, where P1 and P3 were having, now those values are also now invalidated. Now at this point, if you look at the directory, says that for this particular block, it is kept in an exclusive state by processor P2. So the contents in the main memory and the content that is available in P2 may not be same. So P2 has the latest value. So this is what we have now. P2 has the latest value in exclusive state. Let us consider one more request. P4 has a write miss. So now in this case, know that P2 is the one who has it. So P4 encounter a write miss. The contents in main memory are not correct. So P2 has to write back. P2 will write back its contents since it is in an exclusive state. It will write back its contents into the main memory, and then it gets itself invalidated. So P2 has to become zero because when you are E is one, only one of the bit in P2 has to be one. So P4 fetches the block from main memory and then set it to E. So initially it was P2. Now it is P4, which has kept in an exclusive state. So looking at directory, we get a clear idea who is holding and what is the state. Now let us say P1 has a read miss. So when P1 has a read miss, P1 should know by looking at the directory knows that P4 has the latest value. So P4 can be asked to supply the data to P1. And now P1 and P4 both will keep because it is only a read miss. So P1 doesn't want an exclusive access to the block. So now both P1 and P4 will hold it. So since both of them are holding, the exclusive bit will no longer be set. That's exactly what you see. P1 will supply the data. So P1 and P4 has its sharing bit one. So this particular block is now available both in P1 and in P4, but the exclusive value is not set. So whatever this was initially one, now that is going to become zero. So what we have done here, we are talking about a scenario of four processors accessing a single cache block. They have different kind of operations, read and write. So whenever there are read misses, accordingly the request is coming into the directory. The directory will take its appropriate steps. It will change some of the bits what it inside. 
So this bit combination represents what is the status of the block, who are all the sharers of the block at this point. And if the block is kept in an exclusive state by some processor, then who is going to keep? So what we have to understand, when the E bit is equal to 0, there can be more than one possible ones as sharer. But when the E bit equal to 1, there can be only one particular processor who will be calling the latest copy of the cache block. Now let us see the last operation that we have, P4 has a right miss. So now if P4 has a right miss, currently P1 is holding E, so we have to invalidate P1 and use the block after setting E. So in this case, this will be set back to 0 and P4 was to perform a write, so exclusive access has to be set to 1. Now let us go into deeper into what is that the standard directory based protocol. So, so far what we have done is a small implementational level work. So, in the case of a standard directory based protocol, there are possible three states, which are the state, a cache block can be in shared state, that means one or more processors have data and it is up to date with the memory. The second one is known as an unshared state, it is called U, so no processor has a copy of it, so that means no cache has a valid data. The last one is known as an exclusive state, there exists one processor which is known as the owner which has the data but memory is out of date. So the first one, the moment you see that cache block is in S state, that means the copy of the cache and copy of main memory are same. When it is in E state, then main memory is not correct. The latest value is available in the cache. Now let us see what is a directory structure. So this is what is known as a central directory. For each cache block, there will be a row that is associated. Now what are the contents of the row? As mentioned now, the state of the cache is been represented. So the state can be, first one is known as an uncached state, shared state and exclusive state. Now what is the block number or block address that you are cocking and the list of sharers that you have. So the state will represent, so previously we have learned a protocol where we have p plus 1 bits. Now this is a more simplified one. The state will tell you whether it is in the shared mode or an exclusive mode. If it is an exclusive mode, the sharer bit will tell you who is keeping that in an exclusive mode. If it is a shared state, then the list of sharers will tell you who all have the latest copy of that particular cache location. So the block address will give a list of sharers. So list of caches that contain a copy of the block. So typically stored as a bit vector, this is a bit vector. So if there are 10 processors, then this is a 10 bit value. So if the ith bit is set, it means that the ith cache has a copy of this block. So this is the way how the directory structure works. Now what are the operations? The directory basically receives three kind of messages. The first message is known as a readx message. Someone wanted to perform a read. The second category of messages are known as a write, but there are two variants of write. One is known as a regular write that is called writex. Second one is known as an upgrade. So I was having the block. Initially, now I wanted to upgrade the block for an update. That is called writex u. U stands for an update operation. So regular write means I do not have the block. I wanted to take the block fresh for writing. Previously, I have the block, but I do not have permission to write on it. But anyway, I have the block there. Now, in order to write on it, I have to upgrade my privileges. So the third kind of message is some block is been evicted out. So a readex operation which indicates a read, a writex operation which indicates a write request, a write update operation means I have uh, a write upgrade means I do have the block, but then I have to upgrade my level in order to write it and the last one is known as evict. Now what are the actions taken by directory? Let us try to understand when there are three messages that it gets. So once it gets a redux message, what it does, it locates the cache that contains the block. So how do you know? The set of sharers. So the directory will know the moment I get a read directory will know who are the sharers and then you have to fetch the block. Now when it comes to a write text or a write upgrade, it will ask all the sharers to invalidate their lines because someone wanted to perform a write on it. So whoever is sharer, they have to invalidate and then you will give an exclusive rights to the cache line that wanted to perform a write. So evict means you delete the cache from the list of sharers. So if someone is telling that I am evicting this particular block then that particular block's information should be removed from the directory with respect to this particular processor. Now, 
to continue with directory operations like what i mentioned the directory receives read x operation and upgrade request from various nodes it sends an invalidation or downgrade messages to sharers as and when required and it forwards this request to the memory if needed so rather there is no broadcasting it takes a selective call and when to contact some particular processors and when to contact main memory and it replies to the requester and updates the sharing state so in this way the directory is a central bookkeeping mechanism and it is from this directory appropriate messages are being sent so this protocol is very simple to design and uh, the exact forwarding path is depending on the implementation so think of a case that you have a request that is been coming and it is going to be a read request but currently imagine that the state of the cache block is in exclusive state so someone else is using it and the latest copy is not in main memory so main memory is out of update with respect to this particular cache block so scenario is someone looking for a data which is now kept by some other cache block in exclusive state now in this directory based coherence protocol the directory can send a message telling that someone wanted to read so kindly send your latest data to him so that now he is going to be in an updated state at the same time you have to update the main memory so all these are smaller implementational variations that we do so in short directory is a central entity and based upon the request whether it's a going to be a read x request or it can be a write x request or it can be a write upgrade or it can be an evict message depending on the messages appropriate actions are being taken now similar to what we have seen in the case of a snoop based cache coherence mechanism here also we have a state transition diagram so the diagram consists of two portion first one is this where i am going to talk about transitions from u state and s states so these are all outgoing edges from u and s and the next state is about the transitions from e state so if you put up both these things together then it becomes a single state transition diagram so for ease of understanding let us try to do step by step imagine that the state is in the s state so now p sends a message now what is a message the message and the action that is been done is dependent on two things first one what is the operation that p is asking for second one what is the state of the cache so p1 is going to send a message now what is the state of the cache imagine let the cache memory or the cache block is in s state and it's a read x message now if it is a read x message and the state tell it's an s you send a read x message to one of the sharers what the directory will send the message to one of the sharers ask him to forward the copy so rather than taking it from main memory the directory will contact one of the sharers and then ask him to supply the data to p so now from this point onwards the sharers list include whoever was the initial sharers into that p is also added into the list of sharers now let us try to see what happens on a write write text message so when you are in a shared state when you are in an s state when a write text message come you send write text to all the sharers so the directory will upon looking into the directory for this particular block you come to know that there are some sharers are there now you send a write text request to all the sharers now if that is a write text request to all the sharers you ask one of the sharers to forward this copy now at this point onwards the sharer value is only p and your state is moved from s to e so you are now moving to an exclusive state so in short when there is a write text request it means that after the moment it is going to write nobody else should keep it in the shared state so this particular processor that is a p should only keep it in the e state so you ask all of them basically it has to be an invalidate but we are not invalidating at their point we ask all of them to send a copy from them and the sharer value is now currently that is p so in this case they have to evict the block also the block that is keeping there has no meaning at all okay so basically the operation that is been done in this case is an evict so that means now sharer is going to be only that p now what if it is a right upgrade you send a right upgrade to all the sharers other than b so p wanted a right upgrade it is also a sharer at this point 
it is going to be keeping the value that is there. In this case, the others are going to have that, but they are not having the latest copy because the value is still the same. So, the difference between writex and writex upgrade is in the case of an upgrade, P is already a sharer and there are many other sharers. I just wanted to tell the other sharers to evict. So, they will evict their block, whereas P will be retaining the block, there is no need to supply the deal. Whereas, in the case of a write text, it is happening because of a write miss. Now, let us see what happens when you are an uncached state. When you get a read text, then you are the only one. So, you are going to perform the share x value is been given to you and it is a write text, then the sharer is just P and then you are going to read the value from the main memory. So, in this case, uh, whether you are in a shared state or whether you are going to be in the in the exclusive state depends upon the transition that you do. Now, let us see what will happen when P send a message at the same time you are in an E state. So, what are the pos possibilities that you get? Someone send a read x message and then this particular block is in E state. So, send a read x to the sharer, there is only one sharer, ask it to forward a copy and now E will move to S. So, initially only one person was keeping it or one cache was keeping it. Now, someone wanted to perform a read. So, the latest copy is with them because it is in E state, ask it to forward the copy into the block, it state move from E to S. So, now the list of sharer includes whatever was there previously, previously only one element, now into that P is also added. What if it is a write operation? If it is a write operation, you send the write x request to the sharer and ask the sharer to forward the copy. The sharer has to evict that particular block and now at this point the sharer list contains only that is their P. So, when you perform an evict operation in this case, then there are no longer sharers that is available, any kind of a movement that is been happening. So, this is basically the state transition diagram. So, in short what we have seen, we have three states, one is known as U state which is the uncached state, the S state that is the shared state and the E state which is known as the exclusive state. Now, when a processor send a request, you have to see two things. First is, what is the state of that particular cache block in the directory entry? The state can belong to U, it can be E or it can be S. Second one, what is the operation that P, the processor has requested? It can be a read x operation, it can be a write x operation or it can be a write upgrade operation. So, sometimes based on this operation, we have to state, state transition happen and the processor sometimes also need to evict. So, when the evict message comes, then accordingly the directory entry has to remove. Suppose if processor P1 is telling I am evicting this particular cache block, then accordingly the directory entry has to be reflected. So, anyone else subsequently contacting directory, the directory should know that this particular copy is no longer in P1 because P1 has evicted it. So, eviction is also an important operation that is being associated. Now, it is a brief comparison between snooping versus directory cache coherence. So, it is snoopy bus coherence, it is bus based single, single point of serialization of all the memory requests. So, processors observe other processors action. So, what happens in a directory based coherence? Here also single point of serialization, but it is block wise and uh, the directories can be distributed among the nodes and processor make explicit requests. So, there is no broadcasting that has been involved. So, the directory tracks which all cache have the block and the directory coordinates all invalidation and update process. So, what are the advantages and disadvantages? If you consider a snoopy bus coherence, the miss latency is very short because you send a request and uh, then the bus transaction to the main memory, all others are snooping on it. So, typically cache miss latency is less and the global serialization is easy because the bus already will provide arbitration. So, whoever access the bus that is the serial order in which the requests are propagating. What are the, the demerits, the limitations? It relies on a broadcasting. So, this broadcasting will create lot of hurdles. It is on overhead in terms of area, power, consumption and it is a single point of serialization, but that will result in a non-scalable fashion. It cannot scale it well. Now, if you go to directory based to coherence, it let us look into the plus points. It does not require any kind of broadcasting and it is highly scalable with whatever is the interconnect that you use.
but the limitation is it had some kind of an indirection first the request has to go to directory and then from the directory it is going to main memory so this level of indirection will increase the cache miss penalty and it requires some extra storage bit to track the share of sets because the directory uh, we keep it for each of the cache blocks so if you have 1 million cache block 1 million entry would be there in the directory and accordingly the directory management has its own challenge so both has its own plus and minus now if you someone ask you what is going to be the best one is it snoop based cache coherence best or is it the directory based cache coherence best the answer lies it on if you are going to talk about a small system with very few limited number of processors all connected to bus snoop based cache coherence is the best solution but modern multi core processors which will come to know about tiled chip multi core processors and all down the line in this course they are no longer connected by a single bus there is an interconnection mechanism a packet switching mechanism where all nodes are not going to snoop upon a common medium in this case the conventional way of snooping and taking action will not work at all so at that case only a directory based cache coherence work of course the challenges of where to keep the directory directory bottleneck everything would be there now let us see what are the limitations of the directory based protocol the first limitation is entry for each block in a program so we need to have some storage such that there should be an entry for each of the cache block inside a program so if i am going to talk about a program which has 100 cache blocks then my directory entry will have 100 rows and each of the row correspond to one unique cache block now in each of the directory entry an entry is required for all the constituent caches so if there are 100 possible places in which this processor can keep it that means 100 processors are going to work then each directory entry i should have 100 bits which will represent the processors the directory itself can become a point of contention where will you keep the directory so every processors will look forward to send the request first to directory so directory can be flooded with multiple requests that is been coming so what are the solutions the first solution is cache the directories for every cache block we require a directory entry so what you can do is keep the state of a limited number of cache blocks only so the most frequently used cache block entry only that i am keeping in the directory the others are just invalidated so accordingly cache misses will increase so it's a performance uh, versus storage trade off the second problem is talking about for every cache block let's say this is my cache block and if there are 100 potential processors then it's a 100 bit value now rather than that can i group them so that is called list of sharers to a group of sharers if i divide this 100 processors into group of 25 so each of this group consists of four processors then with 25 bits i can handle so but it has its own challenges but then this will reduce the number of bits overhead in the directory and third one is the limitation of directory being a single point contention why do you keep directory in a central place can we think of distributed directories so these are the three solutions that we have so for each of the limitation that we address modern research has come up with multiple solutions for it so the first one is when you have large directory the problem is for every cache block i need to have an entry in directory can i have most frequently used cache block just like a similar to a cache memory concept for a big main memory we can have a small directory cache which will consist of only the directory entries for most frequently used one the others all has to be invalidated the second problem is for every processor we need to have a bit can i have a group of sharers so that each directory entry size will be reduced the third one single point of bottleneck that can be avoided with the help of distributed directories let us now see each one of them one by one in brief so i to get a superficial attention on these points so what is known as group sharing how to maintain the list of sharers so solution one is a fully mapped scheme if there are n processors then we need to have a bit vector of n processors each block is associated with a bit vector so i am going to talk about a block address let's say there are 16 processors and uh, there would be one bit each for all of the 16 processors so you you may have a state all other parameters that you have seen in directory in short one bit per processor so i have to manipulate this 16 bit upon this request so what is the solution to 
a group mapped scheme that we can use. So, I maintain a bit for a set of caches and then you run a snoopy protocol inside that set. So, those processors should have a snooping mechanism, but this set of processors is been collected together and then we call it as a group. So, a directory based protocol at a group level and a snoop based protocol within that group. So, how do you do that? So, the same initial bit values that whatever we have seen, I am going to write it. Imagine the first two processors shown in the green color, I am call it as group 1, the next two 4 processors to group 2, next two 4 processors to group 3 and the last two 4 processors shown in red color for group 4. So, if there exists at least one sharer in group 1, then the bit is 1. Here all of them are 0, so it is 0. If there is at least one, then the bit is 1. Here there is at least one, then the bit is 1. So, even though you have 16 processors here and now I am going to make it as just only 4 groups. So, the number of bits required is 4. Now, how do I know which are the sharers? There should be a snoopy protocol between these 4. Similarly, another snoopy protocol. So, the layout, the architecture of these 4 processors should be in such a way that they have a common time shared bus which can have an underlying snoopy protocol that is been done. So, in this way, larger processors of the order of 1000 plus, then I can keep it as a 2 level hierarchy, a bigger hierarchy with a group of processors which are controlled by a directory structure and the next level is within that particular group, the processors run on a snoopy protocol. Now, we talk about uh, distributed directory. So far, we have seen directory is kept in a single place. Now, can I split the directory? So, split the physical address space. A directory handles the request for that part. So, let us say this is my entire physical address space and I am going to divide the physical address space into 5 chunks. So, the directory associated with the addresses in this range, this directory may be kept in location 5. The information pertaining to the cache blocks who belong to this address range that belong to another directory. So, in short, what I do is the entire set of directory. For example, if I have total of 1000 sets and I am going to divide into 5 subcomponents. So, each of the subcomponent has 200 sets. Let us say these 200 sets what you have, these 200, the, the directory of these 200 sets is kept in one place inside your multi-core processor. So, any request to these 200 sets of cache, it will go to this directory and that directory will give you who are the sharers, the requests are going. So, now the home node, whoever is generating a request, I should know, look at my cache block address. If it belong to this range, then contact this directory, directory 1. If it belong to the another set of range, contact directory 2, which may be in a different location inside the chip. So, rather than all the directory entries keeping in one location, which will create a contention or a bottleneck in accessing the directory. We can now think of splitting these directories into smaller subcomponents and based upon the cache block address, the requester has to send to the appropriate directory. This concept is known as distributed directories. So, this distributed directory will resolve the issue of a single point contention that you have. So, a directory handles request for for the part of address that it is going to deal with. Now, let us going to talk about what is mean by true sharing versus false sharing. So, think of a case that true sharing refers to a problem where let us say multiple cores are there, they are frequently writing to the same shared variable. So, you have P1, P2 and P3, let us say all of them are going to work with a variable called X. So, this is your cache block. And in the cache block, I am talking about a one variable and everyone is accessing. So, this is a real true sharing. X is a variable that is being shared and then X is going to be continuously used. So, when P1 want X, a copy is this entire cache block copy will come to P1. Later, when P2 want it, P1 has to be invalidated and P2 wanted to write it. So, the copy will come to P2. Later, when P3 want it to write on X, so, P2 has to be invalidated, the complete block will go to P3. So, in this way, this block is moving from between this processors P1, P2 and P3 completely because exactly they are going to write on the variable X. Now, what is known as false sharing? False sharing refers to multiple cores writing to different variables that are on the same cache block. So, now think of a case 
I am going to talk about a cash block where one word is x, another word is y. So, this is my cash block. Now, I have processors P1, P2, P3 and P4. In this case, what happens is, maybe I will take two processors for convenience, P1 and P2. P1 is continuously writing on x and P2 is continuously writing on y. So, P1 is telling P1 is equal to x plus 1, x plus 2 like that. Continuous updation of x happens and P2 continuous updation of y happens. Since x and y are part of the same block, whenever P1 want x and then I am going to bring it, the entire block will go to P1. Later one, P2 wanted to write on y, but then it will show that the block is kept in an exclusive state by P1. It has to be invalidated. So, the latest block will come to P2. So, the updated x together with the y will come to P2. So, now this particular block is no longer present in P1. It is now present in P2. P2 will update y. So, y get a new value. Suddenly, P1 wanted to write on x. Even though x is not updated by P2, since x is also part of a block which is accessed by P2, then P2 has to be invalidated. The complete goes, block goes to P1. Later, it come back to P2. So, here also the block moves. But actually, I am not sharing any variable. They are only sharing variables which are part of the same block. So, P1 works on one variable, P2 work on another variable. P2 is never using a variable that is updated by P1. But still, since we have a granularity that is operating at a block level, there is nothing that you can do. So, fault sharing refers to multiple cores writing to different variables that are on the same cache block. So, when different threads or processors access different memory words within a block, the block will keep bouncing between the cache. So, there are two programs or two processors what I am talking. They access different memory words within a block. Then the value will be bouncing between these caches. So, this is known as a false sharing and this will create unnecessarily bottleneck and this is a challenge that uh, we have. So, since the coherence is always operating at a block level and our block is like this and this is going to create a huddle. So, with this we are coming to the end of uh, this cache coherence protocols. In today's lecture video, we learned about the concept of directory based cache coherence. Directory is a new mechanism to which multiple processors are sending their request and directly absorb this request. Look at what are the sharers, accordingly specific messages are being sent and specific invalidation requests are being going. There is no broadcasting that has been there and directory handles this. So, in this way, we, are learned, we have learned about a cache coherence protocol, which is very much up to date to the modern multi-core architectures. So, from a snoop based cache coherence system that we learned in the last video and today we have the knowledge about this directory based cache coherence as well and together can be used upon from a computer architect perspective, what is the kind of requirement? Are we working upon a small setup with very few number of processors, sharing a common data bus? Go for snooping protocol. If you are going to talk about a large system with hundreds of processors with an underlying network on chip infrastructure or a non bus based infrastructure wherein snooping is not possible, directory coherence will give you the answer. So, with this, we come to the end of uh, uh, this cache coherence. Thank you.